Welcome to Antarctic Stories, a podcast that takes you behind the scenes into the rich world of people who live, work, and undertake daring expeditions in the polar regions. My name is Heather Thorkelson, and I'll be your host today. Michael Andersen, a Danish national, is 34 and lives just south of Oslo, Norway. After college, he joined the basic military training in Denmark, as well as the Royal Life Guards. Following that, he became a certified carpenter and took an internship on Vancouver Island for a few months. As soon as that internship was finished, he moved almost straight away to Africa for four months working as a voluntary carpenter on Zanzibar. As if the change from Canada to Zanzibar wasn't dramatic enough, Michael then moved straight from Africa to Greenland's west coast in Ilulissat, and what should have been four months became a year. While there, he completed the Arctic Circle Race cross-country skiing. By summer 2011, he began a bachelor degree in outdoor life in Norway, but after the first year, he decided to apply for the Arctic Nature Guide program in Svalbard. Whilst living in Svalbard, Michael worked part-time with dog sledding in addition to attending school, and it was during this time that he applied for Denmark's Sirius Patrol, an elite unit of the Danish Navy which enforces Danish sovereignty in the Arctic wilderness of northern and eastern Greenland. The bachelor degree ended up taking six years because he was one of the very few accepted into the Sirius Patrol and took three years off to realize that goal. He served on the patrol from 2014 to 2016. The dream to join the Sirius Patrol had been with Michael since childhood, when he first heard about it as a Boy Scout back in Denmark. This tough job in the far north, beyond the wall. Extreme cold, darkness, hard work, a harsh environment, living in a tent and eating dry food for months sounded very tempting. Michael felt it was the only way to experience the feeling of old Arctic dog sledding expeditions whilst in complete solitude with only your colleague and 13 dogs to rely on. These days, Michael is back in Norway and has just finished a master's degree in nature-based tourism. Michael Anderson, welcome to Antarctic Stories. Thank you very much, Heather. Thank you. It's an honor. I'm so happy to have you on. I mean, it's not often that I get a chance to speak with someone who's been in the Sirius Patrol. Now, for people who have never heard of it, can you tell us a little bit more about the Sirius Patrol and why it exists? Yeah, sure, for sure. The patrol existed since, uh, the official patrol has existed since 1950 today. But prior to that, there's a story of why it even started. So there's a long trapper season uh, and a trapper's uh, era in the northeast coast, small but as well, with many different nations. And um, at some point, they had to figure out uh, who it belongs to, because it's not nobody's land anymore. A no man's land. And um, in 1933, the uh, International Court in Hague decided that it was to be Danish. But due to that, the area is so big, you have to uh, claim the serenity, you have to be present in the area. And then there's a few years in between with the war and the period about that. There were people on the coast at that time as well, trying to prevent the Germans from making weather stations. And after that, the official Patrol started in 1950, 18th of August, and it's been going on ever since. Okay. So what are the requirements for applying to the Sirius Patrol? They're the same for both female and male. Females can apply as well. Uh, You have to be between uh, 21 and 30. Uh, Preferably, you have to be single. It's not a requirement, but it's not easy to maintain a relationship when you've gone for so long. Uh, You can't be married and you can't have kids. Other than that, there's a lot of physical things. You have to be, uh, of course, fit. Uh, You have to meet certain demands physically. You have to have good eyesight. You have to have good teeth, which is uh, maybe a surprise for some, but it's very important in the Arctic. It's very cold and and, uh, you're out for so long and if you... If you don't have good teeth, it's it's really a pain, and there's no dentist for a thousand miles. Mm. So that's a that's a that's an important thing. Yeah, 
and then there's a lot of testing going on. Uh, you meet, you apply on mail and internet, and then at a certain date you meet up with a lot of other hopefully uh, uh, young people at the same dream as you. And um, and we were around, I think, seventy the time when I wow. applied. Uh, but then it's not that much, but it's still a lot thinking about you're at a certain time in your life. A lot of people have girlfriends, jobs, under education. You have to have certain things in order to be able to apply. You have to have your personal affairs in order to, because you're away for so long. So, so it narrows it down quite a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, if you can only be between the ages of 21 and 30 and you have to be Danish, so it's only Danish nationals, correct? Then yeah, yeah. even within that group, as you say, you have to have all your affairs in order. You can't or shouldn't really be in a relationship. I mean, it, the, the pool gets smaller and smaller. And then beyond mm -hmm. that, you have to be the kind of person that actually wants to do something as, let's say, extreme <laughs> as going out for two years patrolling the coast of Greenland, right? It's true. It's true. It's not the average job at all. It has, you have to have a certain mindset, I think, to uh, to enjoy these kind of adventures, and also staying away from home. You 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 say you say yes to adventure. You say yes to a lot of the nice things, adventurous things, but you also say no to important time in your life with your friends, your relatives. Things are going home. Your your best friends might have had kids, and there's a lot of things you miss. But well, then again, you gain so much again by saying yes to the adventure. Yes. Or absolutely. seeking it. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned you can be men or women. I know because of a, a Danish female friend of mine, she had really hoped to apply for the series, but at the time she was eligible, women weren't allowed. Is that a relatively recent change that women have also been allowed to apply? I don't remember when they started with this, but at least it's at least been around for five years now that women can apply. Okay. Uh, but so far, and, and uh, there were females when uh, when I applied as well, but uh, they didn't meet the physical demands. And I, I think it's fully possible that they could meet the physical demands. And, and it's all and it's known. Everyone knows what you're supposed to do uh, in advance. You can just read up on it. And there's a lot of males, a lot of people who who don't require that even, even though it's known. So. So you said about 70 applied at the time that you went in to apply. How many actually get accepted? Is, is it an annual thing, like every year there's a new group? Or how does that work, and how, how many per intake? It's an annual thing, and it's uh, each, in, each year it's five persons who get um, uh, started, the, uh, who get sent up to the coast. But they start off with six or eight people on the course. And it's a master's teaching. That means that there's a fresh team coming up each year, and then there's a team up there already that becomes your teachers the first year. And then when you have been there for a year, they go home, and you are the experienced one who teaches uh, the next team who comes oh. up. So six one year and five the next year, and six again and five again, because there's, there's, um, there's a boss who also... Is included in the patrol. He's a part of the 12 that's there at all times. But he has to have done two years before. So is there then, like, train before you actually get sent to the coast, is there a pre-patrol uh, or pre-deployment period where you go through training back in Denmark or somewhere else? Yeah, that's a long training. That's the, the best school I've ever attended, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, it's seven months. starts in in uh, November and there's pretty much everything in that school you have to be good at a lot of things or at least you have to know where to start with a lot of things there's a veterinary course there's an excavator course there's a reverse osmosis course how you make salt water to fresh water there's a, a welding course truck certificate speedboat certificate dentist course firefighter course a lot of different courses. Uh, wow! You have to, yeah, you have to attend. You have to, you have to be able to fix the dogs, sew them up, uh, small operations. Of course, you have to be able to fix yourself as well, or your uh, colleague, because you're only two, two and two. Right. Yeah, you need that basic medical, and of course, as you say, dental. Right, because a lot of things, 
a lot of other parts of your body, you can deal with minor issues, but even a minor issue in the mouth can go so bad so quickly. So I can understand needing some basic dental uh, understanding as well. Yeah, yeah. and you, you're allowed to practice on yourself putting in, uh, what's it called? Um, oh, like the freezing? No, so you can pull out teeth and stuff. Wow. And make small fillings, small fillings you can do as well. Hopefully you don't get the. I didn't get the, to do this uh, on the actual patrol, but you trained for it because it's uh, important. If, uh... So take us to once you arrive in Greenland. I mean, obviously you have to go out on these long patrols with you and one other person and your dog sleds. But is there uh, one particular base where the 12 people that are there are, are based out of or, or how is it set up once you're actually in Greenland? I'll answer that in two seconds. But first, there's uh, on the preschool in the seven months, there's one month of uh, severe to, uh, intensive training in Greenland, where you get uh, shipped up there in the end of January and all of February. So okay. five or four four weeks where there's a lot of training and you get tested to the bare bones, uh, what you're made of and who you are. <laughs> and after that, there's no, there's no hiding for so long and they'll see straight through you in the end. So and what they're looking for so everything will be revealed in that uh, month and after that you're pretty much you're not on the you're not on the team yet you're not you haven't reached the goal but that's the most critical point i'll say wow it's kind of like the make or break point it's the make or break uh, month point yeah it's a, <laughs> it's a long it's one long thing and there's a lot of different things you have to uh, you have to do on your own and also team uh, teamwork wise wow just to veer off for a second, we can, as you say, go back to the whole what happens once you're in Greenland. But in that period, if someone doesn't make it, if, if you're identified as someone who just at the end doesn't have what it takes and you're taken out of the team, do they take, is there someone from like a backup person who's done all the seven months of training that they might bring in to take that person's place? Or what happens in that case? The only way you have you can t- take a place from someone who doesn't fit the requirements is if you've done two years in service before. So wow. that narrows it very, very much. So the year I attended and uh, were on the, um, the school, uh, we were s- seven guys. We all made it to the winter camp. But after the year after, four out of seven uh, got picked out you're kidding so there are only three left and then they have to pick somebody who's been there for two years at least if they can take another year oh man Uh, i mean they can go home and start educations they're not bound by contract at all so they can start uh, start a a regular life so to say Okay, so so you we've made it through that final point. You get sent. It's official. You're starting your two years. What then? Is there is there a main base, or are there a few main bases that you operate out of, or how does that work? There is one main base for the serious sledge patrol. It's called Danebo, hmm. and that's where we operate from. But there are colleagues, not uh, not along the coast. That's uh, t- too much to say. But there is two more bases. One. It's called Mr. Svi, where there's two persons. Preferably, or previously at least, it had to be serious, uh, former serious members of the patrol who were on that post. Today, it's, uh, it's not that strict anymore. There's still a lot of good people who have technical skills and so on to get a station running. So you didn't, you don't have to be a former member of the patrol anymore. And then there's a yeah, station, station north, it's called. Very far up north, 81 degrees. Uh, north, where there's a um, air base with a two two kilometer long, two two point four kilometer long uh, landing that always has to be ready within twenty four hours. So wow. it's a kind of an emer- emergency landing base, and they are six people on the same house as Sirius. Not the same training, not the same uh, job description, mm. but uh, go on a lot of the same courses with those guys. And it's nice to swing by when you're in the wilderness and uh, and you've been away for a month or two and you swing by that station on your way home uh, oh. to say hello to your, your colleagues. So, yeah. So that's nice. That must be really nice. And also a little bit weird if you've been out <laughs> with nothing but the wilderness and landscape for one, two, three months. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, it's a little bit weird, but it's nice to get the good food and a little shower and the dogs can get a bit of rest. Yeah. That's mainly it. That's the main part of it. That's for the dogs to get uh, proper rest for at least a few days, maximum four days. Okay. And then you're, you have to move on again. Then you have to move on. Okay. Yeah. So, so take us, I want to ask you about the dogs, of course, and like feeding the dogs and all this kind of stuff. And even just psychologically the experience for you. But before we even go there, can you tell us a little bit about when you do go out onto a patrol? I know you said to me before we started recording that the longest time is about four months out. So you're, you're out for a long period of time. What does that look like on a daily basis? I mean, obviously you're patrolling the coast, you're, you're making sure that nothing questionable is happening, <laughs> monitoring things and whatnot. But what does a typical day look like with you and your colleague and I guess a dog sled each, right? With how, five dogs each? No, no, you you, uh, draw, you um, go out in pairs and you have one sled and 13 dogs. Okay. Um, but a regular day is <clears throat> up around seven. It depends a bit. Because in the wintertime, when it's very dark, you, uh, you drive at the lightest time of the day. Right. You still have to get up around seven o'clock to talk on the radio to the main station, the Danebor station at 74 degrees uh, latitude. You talk to them each morning, just say, good morning, I'm alive, and how are you? I listen to the weather reports. Mm-hmm. That's basically it. Uh, so that's very short on the radio in the morning. And then you eat, yeah, relax, uh, go out, have a look at the dogs, see how they are, take their food. If they haven't eaten the food, you take it away from them. Pretty much, not straight away after you woke up, but uh, you wake up, but... Uh, not so not so long after. You go out and pick in the food because they can't run if they've just eaten. Right. It has to go a certain amount of time. And then you go in, you, you eat a bit, you relax a bit, and then around 10 o'clock, you drive. You set off and you just drive for approximately 25 kilometers a day in the autumn. So from 1st of November till 22nd of December, ish, depending on the ice. That's at least when it's scheduled. Uh, nature has its own way sometimes, but that's when it's scheduled to drive in the autumn. So it's very it's very dark the rest of the time, as you probably know. You set tent around four four o'clock, and then there's a lot of resting time. And at eight o'clock in the evening again, you you're on the radio with the station. Then there's a bit more than there's news, uh, personal messages. If something happens, you you can always phone in on the on the satellite phone as well. Hmm. It's the same with it. If we, if we have issues or problems with the dogs, hmm. we, we always have a veterinarian on the on the set phone twenty four seven. Right, absolutely, because you have a finite amount of dogs, and it's super important. As it is important to keep yourselves alive and healthy, to keep the dogs alive and healthy. I can imagine. Hmm. Um, so yeah, yeah, one of my questions was going to be, you know, what happens if you get, have a dog that gets ill or gets in a fight or something, which can sometimes happen, or if there's some kind of severe injury. But that makes sense, of course, that you're in regular contact via sat phone and that you have access to a, to a veterinarian. In the event, and perhaps this has happened to you, in the event that a problem with a dog can't be fixed, if it's a severe issue, what happens then? If it can't be fixed at all, and there's nothing to do, You'll have to shoot it. Mm. That's the last way out. Mm. If you're close to a station, let's say two weeks away from a station, you can put the dog on the sledge. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, that is how they did it back in the day, right? And you guys are so far out, so remote. Yeah, yeah, there's nothing to do about that. It, it's a shame, but there's nothing to do about it. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's, not a, it's not a pet in the way that you... They're the best dogs. I love the dogs. Amazing dogs. But it's not a pet in the way you have a pet at home. Right. So if it doesn't work, and if it can't work in the way it's supposed to, <clears throat> of course you have to do something about it. Uh, Absolutely. But it happens very rare, actually, that you have to shoot a dog now. And, then, and uh, that you can't fix it at some point, or at least get it to a station, wait till summer, a plane comes by, and you can flew it back to the main station. Again, if it needs proper recovery for, let's say, a few months, mm-hmm. uh, there's still a, a lot of good years in a sled dog. So you, you really have to consider it very, very carefully mm-hmm. what to do with it. But yeah. if it's an emergency, of course, you have to take care of it yeah. immediately. 
Well, and I mean, it sounds like you guys are trained as best as possible and having a veterinarian there to, to ask questions to. You, you've really covered as many bases as possible. So it is a, an extreme an extreme situation. Um, I definitely, I mean, my husband was a dog musher for many years. And so I know the relationship between a musher and his dogs is a special one. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. although they're not pets, it's, it's, there's a lot of care there. There's a lot of responsibility. So uh, off of the more morbid <laughs> point of the conversation, I, I, just in a logistical sense, how do you feed 11 to 13 dogs on these long patrols? Well, we have something called pemmican. A mix of meat and fat and grains, uh, very powerful, a lot of energy in it, mixed in these small uh, blocks. And we put them out during all summer. A lot of the depots that are along the coast, either uh, old trappers' uh, cabins or similar huts uh, made by the military, put up by the military along the coast, you you fill them up during the summer mm. with heptane. Um, so it's called gasoline, mm -hmm. and uh, food for the dogs, fish for the dogs to, to clean their teeth and just to have a nice snack. Uh, extra fat. If, they, if it's very cold, they can get a bit of extra fat. And food for us, of course. We fill that up in the summertime. So in the very north where you can't sail, they fly out with the twin otter. And in the midsection where there's a lot of ice, but you can still sail, you have help from uh, the Navy as well, mm. the Danish Navy. Each summer they come up, and sometimes they have a helicopter with them as well. Uh, okay. And then they fly in to depots as well. And we get a great great deal of help from uh, other soldiers or colleagues that work in the Navy. Uh, and in the southern part, we sail out ourselves mm. with the two boats as well mm. to the different depots. So there's a lot of work during summer as well, preparing for winter. Yeah, absolutely. And it makes sense, of course, if you only have one sled between the two of you, there's only so much that you can carry. You'd have to be stopping at depots to pick up supplies along the way, both for yourselves and the dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the sled is around. And when it's fully loaded, it has to be between three meters and 65 up till four meters and 30. So it's a very wow. long sledge. Yeah. yeah. It's a big sledge. And you make the sledges yourself uh, in, in the sled team. So you know every detail of it so you can fix it yourself wow along the way yeah that's that's nice but it's also it's you have to you have to be able to fix it yourself so it's really a good thing and also if it's very cold it's nice to know how to <laughs> do things with ropes and uh, tie the knots properly but you can you travel around i think the maximum of you always load the sledge 50 percent extra okay so if, so if you are to travel for four days you load up till six days. Okay. And the minimum the minimum is four days on the sleds. Even if it's just 20 kilometers, you have to drive before you have another another place to rest or a, cave, a cabin or a safe place. Minimum four days on the sleds. Hmm. And I think the maximum I had it was 16. 16 uh, days of food and gasoline and and all that on the sledge, and then it weighs around 550 kilos. Wow. Yeah, so it's a heavy sledge. You're never, you're never sure about the conditions, of course, but if it's pure ice, it doesn't matter how much it weighs, basically. But if it's heavy, deep snow, it's just a hell, and it takes <laughs> so long time to get forth and back. And then sometimes I've walked for a, almost a full day, and maybe only... Four kilometers from they can still see a camp from the day before oh. and that's not uh, it's not it's not the you can't be uh, you can't start becoming annoyed at the situation and on the weather because then you'll be nuts you'll just yeah. get nuts so take it with a smile and um, yeah work along there's a reason and you're the, you're the eyes out there so if you can't get any further that day that's the way it is that's the way and everybody understands uh, everybody understands Hmm. That's, that's the thing about being in a place like that uh, anywhere for the most part in the polar regions is that you realize nature is king. Everything, all decisions are based around nature, right? Yeah. So, you know, in thinking of that and thinking of bad weather, being stuck in deeper snow, you know, the long nights of darkness and that kind of thing, and also the fact that it's polar bear territory. I'm very curious to know if you ran into any hardships, whether it was 
something severe related to weather, animals, or your own physical health during the time that you were in the serious patrol? I had uh, no issues for myself, medically or physically, psychologically. I, I, had, I had the best time of my life. But I like the Arctic. I've been both in Greenland, West Greenland, and Svalbard before I even uh, entered this serious patrol just to prepare properly and see what it was. If I liked the Arctic and I absolutely fell in love, I loved that part of it. Solitude as well. And polar bear country, for sure. You get to see polar bear. And uh, you also get close encounters with polar bears. It's almost, at, at least at some point, you, let's say you're out for a full year. In the, two, in the two years you're there, you have two full winters. So, of course, you get to see a polar bear sometimes. Most of them has been at a distance, let's say, ah, 100 meters away or 200 meters away or even further away, very far away. And you don't drive towards them mm -hmm. just to take this and stuff. You, you don't do that. But uh, sometimes, of course, you, you sleep on the sea ice. You put up your tent, you sleep on the sea ice. You don't have a, um, what's it called, the flare system around your tent. Uh, mm -hmm. lost, or, lost the word now, but uh, anyway, like a string trip, system. Trip wire? Yeah, yeah, exactly, tripwire system. Mm -hmm. We don't use that. We have 13 dogs, and it's the absolute best alarm you can get. But still, wind can, can be tricky, even on the dogs as well. Mm -hmm. So I've tried, so I've tried several times. Sleeping in the tent, I've tried that once. Sleeping in the tent and being woken up by the dogs going crazy. Because there's a polar bear just 30 meters away from the tent. <gasps> and that's a bit exciting because most of them are not aggressive and most of them are just curious. Yeah. But you never know. And you, all, and you have to get up very quickly. So you always sleep with your... Uh, you have, a, you have a, a Glock, a Glock 20 gun, 10 millimeter Glock, and you have a rifle each. So every person has a pistol and a, and a rifle. Mm -hmm. And I slept with my uh, pistol for the two years in, uh, in the tent, a small holster on the chest. So it was fixed to the chest. So I could lay down in my sleeping bag, have a dry and good uh, ready pistol at all times. Mm -hmm. And that was nice when the, not the shit hits the fan, but at least uh, you have to be aware, aware very quickly. Mm -hmm. then, then it's very nice to have a gun. And then if you sleep in huts as well, the dogs are outside. Uh, if they can't hear anything due to the wind, mm -hmm. they can be surprised as well. And then they can start going crazy. And again, you can go out the door and you can have a polar bear three or four meters away from you, standing over the dog with the lift, uh, you know, with one of the hands lifted up, just to, not to, not to hit the dog, but more to like... Uh, touch it and see, well, what's this actually? Maybe it's never seen a polar, a polar dog before a sled dog as well, right? Yeah, yeah. There's not so many people around. There's not so many dogs around. That's why we're there. So maybe the polar bear hasn't even seen the dog before too. So it's interesting to see how they react sometimes. Uh, but there's also polar bears that never, uh, that never, that are not so easy to scare away, definitely. Yeah. And then you have to, to take action. We have flare guns. We have... And we have a lot of shots with us, uh, both with the flare guns and the rifles, so we should be able to scare the most of them away. But some, some are a bit more stubborn. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So the longest patrols that you were out on, or the longest time that you were away from civilization, in Greenlandic terms in that sense, is four months, correct? Without seeing other, anyone else besides your colleague? Uh, you, you do see others. Uh, you, do, you see your colleagues. Cause you start out in the end of January, after Christmas and after New Year's uh, celebration. And also the worst storms are in December, January, and you, you would be laying still in the tent anyways. Mm. So, so, of course, you, you think of your self-safety first, and you have to, have to be careful. Mm -hmm. uh, so we wait a bit. And in the end of January, you start again. And then the first month, you drive around in the southern terrain around the station mm. um, not close to the station but several hundred kilometers away but still uh, so you can circle around and come back to the station okay after after one month because when you have to be flown out in the twin others it have to be it has to be light enough uh, in one day so they can fly out from station north to uh, let's say holland all over uh, very close to canada without shutting off the engine and then fly back to stay 
you know, in one day without turning it off. And they can only do that after 1st of March. So you have to drive around for one month first, and then you fly up and uh, stay for stay, stay at Station North till the weather's good and whatever, and then you fly out. And when you fly out with the dogs, and you're being set off somewhere where it's already planned, when they take off with the plane there, then you have to drive home. Okay. All of the spring trip in total is around 3,200 kilometers. Okay, so so yeah, so you're out for you're you're out for long periods of time, but you're seeing your colleagues on a fairly regular basis when you have to return to the station. Correct? Is that I'm understanding that correctly? Yeah, yeah. Let's say you you you're out for one month. You go into the main station. You're being flown out. When you leave out in the wild, when they fly back, you have a month or a month and a half till you mm. come to station Lord again. Then you okay. meet a few colleagues there. You have uh, resting days for the dogs as well. Mm. And then you drive on uh, back home. I see. Okay. Um, Okay. So in those mm. situations, and actually this is kind of a twofold question, when you're out for these long chunks of time, like a month and a half, what what do you miss the most of sort of modern conveniences, I suppose? uh, I always think of a water boiler. Just to put it aside. (laughs) <laughs> it's not it's not something I miss, but it's something that always strikes my mind how easy it is to boil water <laughs> when you're at home. Or uh, electricity and just it's just a snap and then you go and you read your newspaper, you do something else and ding, then there's boiling water. It's so easy. <laughs> it's not it's not a thing that I miss, but it's a it's a thing that I think of. Yeah. In a way. You're um, aware of its absence. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But the thing I miss most is I think uh, you dream a bit about uh, nice food, uh, what you want for dinner when you come home, or mm-hmm. uh, maybe a phone call to someone you hold dear, or um, mm. th- th- those are the things. But it's really routine. It's a, it's a lot of routine in the job. It's up every day, staying alive, going through the day, mm-hmm. challenging conditions. Sometimes it's just the fantastic day with, perfect conditions, perfect lightings, everything works. And other days it's a blistering storm and yeah, and you don't get to go anywhere. So. Yeah. <laughs> so you bring up a good point, actually, when you said, you know, you miss a good meal because in your bio it's mentioned that you have to eat a lot of dry food. So tell me, what on earth is it that you guys eat on a daily basis when you're out in this remote area? We have, uh, we have the depots as well as... Uh, where the dog have the in the cabins where their their food is, we have food as well, and we have a box, just a, a, a like a box of cotton, and there's a lot of um, dry food in it. There's, there's a lot of chocolate. There's a lot of canned food, soups, uh, pasta, rice, uh, beef jerky, yeah, mustard, uh, Nutella, different things <laughs> in uh, a lot of a lot of chocolate in it. Uh, <laughs> But different things that you can just mix up, and it's always a weird mix. You get uh, we only make one st- one pot with a lot of mixed uh, things in it. But when you're hungry, everything just goes down. Yeah. Uh, and then I try to make the same food at home, and it's uh, it doesn't work at all. <laughs> it's not good. It doesn't taste uh, it doesn't taste nice. But uh, <laughs> but when you're hungry, it, it's really good. Mm. Yeah, you're not as picky, perhaps. <laughs> No, 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 no. And you eat a lot of calories. I, I ate a full plate of chocolate, sometimes one and a half every day, and I still lost weight. Uh, wow. Oh, my gosh. But you don't eat, you don't have a lunch. You don't have a lunch break. You have uh, breakfast in the morning, and then you drive all day. And then you put up tent, because it's, it's extremely cold to stop and and eat. Uh, if you drive on the sea ice, you can't build a wall of snow. hmm uh, there's there's really nothing to stay behind, no trees whatsoever. So right. So uh, we just drive all day, keeping ourselves warm, and swing the arms around for uh, almost all day, yeah. and uh, put up the tent and get some get some heat in it, and um, and then you have then you have dinner. Do you find that after you came home, that because you were in that habit of eating breakfast and then eating sort of an early dinner, let's say, that you continued doing that at home for a while or did you go right back into breakfast, lunch and dinner, usual, your usual habits from before? Uh, straight back to usual. <laughs> on, 
on, on the base, um, as a part of the training, you have a food course as well. Five days on a school where you learn to make food because there's no one else to do it. Yeah. As the rest of the things. So as and one week you have the kitchen. So you have to make breakfast, lunch and dinner for all the others for one week. And that that's the that's the fixed time every day. Eight o'clock, boom, you sit and eat. So yeah. And lunch as well, fixed time. So it's the same. But yeah. on the sled strip it's not a problem at all. You don't think of it. Yeah. I I never think of it as a problem. So. Hmm. Very interesting stuff. Okay, so I, I kind of want to go a little bit more into the psychological element of what it's like to be on such a unique team of people. What is the most important thing that you learned about yourself, about being out there in the polar wild with such isolation? I got to know myself in a very good way, what I'm capable of myself, and where, where are your limits, and what can you actually do? How is your attitude towards things? And that's something that you have always, you have that with you always afterwards, definitely. That you can, you can fix a lot of things. You can do a lot of things, practical things. Uh, don't be afraid of how to, how to fix things. Just start and figure it out along the way. Mentally, um, it gives me a lot of inner peace or how you say calm. Mm -hmm. I'm a very calm person today. I know myself very well compared to, I think, a lot of people, if they're ne if they're never faced with something challenging that you can't walk away from, which you can't out there, you can. You have no option. You can, you just can't. But at home, you can pretty much always walk away in at some point or get help or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, that gives you some, some kind of rest. It's it's a nice it's a nice, I can't really say it's a fee it's a feeling maybe or at least a state of mind that you know. You're capable of a lot of things and you know yourself very well. Yeah, absolutely. Looking back on the two years that you spent, what would you say about your experience is the thing that you hold the most dear to your heart? Uh, I would love for everyone to have the, ex to the same experience regarding to nature. Being out in nature for so long time that... that and you feel the elements, you, you're in it, you have the worst storms of your life, you lay in a tent for days, uh, but you also have the most spectacular, magnificent sights you can imagine uh, at the same time. And you have a close bond with the dogs. And <clears throat> um, I mean, you spend 24 seven with them. They become your lifeline and your very good friends, so to say. Because you know some of them from when they are just cops. And every single day back at the station, we have a rule that when you enter the house, uh, the main the main house where you eat and uh, uh, the offices are and stuff like that, if there are any puppies, puppies outside, uh, you have to clap them or talk a bit with them so they mm -hmm. get really, really comfortable with you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the bond between, between the dogs and... Um, and uh, us as uh, as patrol members are, are completely unique up there. That's a, that's the that's the thing I hold very dear. And if I lived in the polar uh, regions, or if I ever move back to the polar regions, I'm definitely going to get sled dogs again at some point. But mm -hmm. for uh, where I live now, it's not a, it's not an issue for me. Mm -hmm. Do you, when you had to leave in the end of your deployment, was it really tough to leave the dogs? No, nah, I, I worked with dogs before on Svalbard, where we had more than 150 dogs at that time. Mm. And uh, it's, it's an everyday job, dog mushing. So it, of course, you have to, you, you're a bit sad leaving the dogs, but then again, I say you, you had them for two years mm. and you, they were they were fantastic, but then again, uh, on to new things, and there's always uh, another dog. If you want, I mean, all puppies are nice, so, mm, yeah. so you can get, get another dog, and and I think you'll be just as happy again. Yeah. But of course, it's, it's difficult to say uh, to say goodbye, and also if you had if you had special um, experiences with some of the dogs. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so you just now finished your master's thesis in nature-based tourism. What is next for you? Next is actually a master's degree more. 
Uh, sounds a bit weird, but I'm at a place now very close to the school, and the uh, and my fiance still needs two years more in school. Mm -hmm. So I might as well take a take a, some few extra courses and uh, maybe ending up with a master's uh, in natural resources. Nice. See how it goes. Can you imagine yourself going back uh, north, as you say, and potentially getting some dogs in the future? Well, I mean, I'd love to. And I could find a job. I'm a certified framer as well. So it's not a problem. But I'm not going to work with that anymore. I'm going to work with nature-based tourism. But I think my, my fiancé has got another job, which is not... Uh, that's not a big requirement for that job in the Arctic, at least Svalbard and uh, Greenland and those conditions. Um, but you never know. At some point, maybe, maybe not. I'm definitely going back summer and winter again, just on vacation. And I have a lot of friends who lived in uh, Longyearbyen and uh, uh, still and absolutely loves it. So, uh, of course, I'm going to go out and visit them again at some point. Cool. That's great. Well, Thank you so much for sharing all of your experience in this Serious Patrol with our listeners today. It's been real fun getting to ask all the questions that I've been wanting to ask for so long. <laughs> and um, yeah, we hope, to, uh, we hope to see you again sometime, but thank you again for, for spending time with us today on the Antarctic Stories. You're welcome, most welcome. Okay. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of Antarctic Stories. If you like the stories we bring to you, please subscribe for future episodes. And if you want to help the podcast, leaving a rating or review greatly assists us in reaching a wider audience. Antarctic Stories is a production of Twin Tracks Expeditions, your experts in small ship expedition cruises to the Arctic and Antarctica. We love sharing our insider knowledge to help you find the perfect ship for your next polar expedition. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, or at TwinTracksExpeditions.com.